I was at a meeting in San Francisco and one of my best friends happened to be there for a different meeting. He's an astrophysicist and I thought I would uh, go to his meeting so I went and you know didn't pay the registration of course and just sat in on one of the sessions or several sessions and I remember during one session uh, a distinguished looking uh, researcher presented about a 10 minute talk and there was this buzz of excitement near the end of it and I didn't understand any of it. It was all mathematics and formulae and at the end when people were applauding I asked my friend what you know what all that meant and he was very excited and he said he just proved that the Sun is going to explode 250 million years earlier than we thought <laughs> so e even those complicated things can be made easy and my my talk hopefully won't be too difficult at all it's going to be primarily descriptive and I'm going to talk a little bit about something called uh, Devic's disease, also known as Devic's syndrome or neuromyelitis optica. And this is relevant, of course, because transverse myelitis or inflammatory problems in the spinal cord are one component of Devic's syndrome. This is an outline of what I'm going to talk about. It's sort of Devic's 101. The simple definition of Devic's is that it's myelitis, usually a transverse or complete spinal cord lesion, um, in association with optic neuritis, that is inflammation and demyelination in the optic nerves. Now historically, for the last century or so, <clears throat> Devix has been considered uh, a particularly severe variant of multiple sclerosis, although um, recently I think it's now coming to be appreciated that the differences between Devix and MS not only suggests that it may be a separate disorder uh, altogether, but also there's probably a lot that we can learn about multiple sclerosis and transverse myelitis from Devic syndrome. A couple of the key features um, that I'll talk about a little bit more uh, are some of the tests that we do to make a diagnosis of Devic's. Devic syndrome usually presents with multiple attacks or relapses of myelitis and optic neuritis, and it's interesting that these people off, almost always have a normal or nearly normal brain scan, which is very uncommon in multiple sclerosis. In the spinal cord, they show lesions like you've seen on many radiographs, I'm sure, that have been shown at this, at, at this meeting, where there's a long area of inflammation in the spinal cord extending over at least three of the vertebral segments of the spine. And the spinal fluid shows uh, also interesting abnormalities that we don't see in multiple sclerosis. There's lots of cells in inflammation, which can occur in MS, but there tends to be more of it. And there's the presence of these cells called neutrophils, which are never present in MS. The other thing about Devix that makes it interesting, but also uh, for some people unfortunately devastating, is that it can follow a relapsing course. It can be monophasic, that is, have one set of events and then no relapses, as transverse myelitis often does, or usually does, but it can also be relapsing, that is, people can over time continue to have more attacks of both myelitis and optic neuritis. I'll just present a brief case. Um, when I was still at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, we saw um, uh, an African-American woman. She was a family physician in her 40s. And she'd had transverse myelitis in 1986 in the thoracic level. And she recovered moderately well. She was able to walk, had some difficulty. About uh, almost three years later, she developed sequential optic neuritis. So loss of vision in one eye and then the other and made a partial recovery and was really doing well enough to be able to continue to practice. Her spinal fluid showed lots of white blood cells, lots of neutrophils. Over the next five years of her illness, she had 10 more relapses, mostly in the spinal cord, but also uh, in the optic nerve. And by the time that uh, she was first seen at Mayo, she um, was unfortunately paraplegic and blind in one eye and no, no longer able to practice. This is an MRI one of her MRIs, which shows a lesion beginning here at the top of the C5 vertebral level and extending all the way up um, almost into the brain stem, the lower part of the medulla. And this is her brain scan, which despite having 15 attacks, really is almost completely normal. There's a couple of tiny little white spots here, but this, is, this certainly doesn't meet the criteria for what we see in multiple sclerosis.
Devic syndrome or Devic's disease is uncommon, as transverse myelitis is fairly uncommon. We think it's perhaps 1% of all people that end up being seen in MS clinics, and indeed most of these people are in fact diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. We're trying to change that. We're trying to increase the recognition of this as a different disorder. Um, women tend to get it more than men do, especially the relapsing variety. Um, the age of onset is very variable. It can begin in infancy. It can occur in an 80-year-old, but on average it's about 30 years old or so, perhaps a little older uh, for people with the relapsing form. Most people don't have a family history of multiple sclerosis or, or other demyelinating diseases uh, unless they have this relapsing form and then a few percent, uh, 10 to 15 percent, might have someone else in the family. But if they do, that other person almost always has rather typical MS. And there also seems to be an increased proportion of Devix syndrome in the MS type cases that we see in, in people of non-Caucasian descent, especially Asians such as Japanese people and people of Hispanic and African American descent. And in a lot of ways the relapsing form, the continuing form of Devic syndrome is much like um, uh, what is seen in, ja in multiple sclerosis in Japan where uh, the attacks have, uh, have seem to favor the optic nerve in the spinal cord and that suggests there may be some genetic factors involved in Devix. <clears throat> Why is it important to make a specific diagnosis of Devix? Well, um, we want to be able to distinguish Devix from both transverse myelitis and multiple sclerosis for several reasons. One is for practical purposes to try to be able to describe to the person who's afflicted by the disorder what their prognosis is likely to be. And that helps us understand what we need to do for treatment. It also allows us to try to sort out um, Devix from multiple sclerosis and transverse myelitis in order to study it and learn more about it. <clears throat> Devic syndrome is named after a neurologist named Devic. He wasn't the very first person to realize the association, but he was the one that, along with one of his students, uh, Francis Galt, summarized a number of cases and it now bears his name. And they initially, just over a hundred years ago, <clears throat> described the association of transverse myelitis, an acute event, with bilateral optic neuritis, so optic neuritis affecting each eye. And if you pick up a neurology textbook today, people still write that Devix disease, or neuromyelitis optica as it's called, we'll called the classic definition, is a monophasic disease uh, consisting of bilateral optic neuritis, so affecting both eyes, and a severe episode of myelitis. And, they always, and they, uh, authors usually emphasize that it's monophasic. So bang, 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 optic neuritis, optic neuritis, myelitis, and then that's it. Now, despite the fact that that's still written a lot, <clears throat> um, if you look back at the literature through the entire 20th century, you can see that many of the cases that have been reported and called Devix have in fact behaved quite differently. As I mentioned, Devix can be relapsing, and this has actually been reported back into the 1920s, so people can have recurrent events. The optic neuritis can affect both eyes, but it can also affect only one eye. And the myelitis, although it's usually severe, um, is not always severe. There's a number of diagnostic criteria that have uh, been developed in the last 15 years to try to, again, separate what makes Devic syndrome different from multiple sclerosis. And I listed some of these in the syllabus. Based on our experience, which we reported a, two or three years ago, um, where we reviewed all of, the, all of the people that had been evaluated at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester um, going back to 1950, <clears throat> we came up with the following criteria. <clears throat> Excuse me. Obviously, you need myelitis, and you need optic neuritis, although you only need to have it in one eye. And there shouldn't be any other symptoms or signs outside of the optic nerve or the spinal cord. We found in our series that the time course wasn't important. You didn't have to have all of the attacks one right after another within a few days or a couple of weeks. But in fact, some people develop this disorder, and their attacks are months or even years apart. You also have to have some supportive criteria for the diagnosis, at least one of these three major criteria, um, that is, and these are the ones I mentioned before, normal, normal brain MRI, the cord MRI showing 
a very uh, longitudinally extensive lesion, which we uh, rarely see in multiple sclerosis, and then the unusual spinal fluid abnormalities. Other things that we think help to some degree include the presence of bilateral optic neuritis. Optic neuritis in each eye can occur in MS as well. That's why it's only a minor criterion. And then the severity of the events. Multiple sclerosis attacks are usually not as severe as they are in DEVIX, and they usually improve more than DEVIX does. Now, as far as how it presents, there's, there's really not much about an attack of transverse myelitis in DEVIC syndrome that can separate it from transverse myelitis of other causes. It is usually a true transverse myelitis involving both sides of the cord. It's usually rapid in its onset, occurring over hours to, to, uh, to days, presenting sometimes with back pain or neck pain, followed by a rapidly progressive uh, paraplegia or quadriplegia loss of sensation below the level uh, of the lesion, usually to all modalities, loss of bladder function, and often something called paroxysmal tonic spasms, which are um, involuntary movements, for example, of the arm, where it will spasm up like this involuntarily and be painful and then relax. This is something that's often mistaken for a seizure, but that happens in about a third of people who eventually develop the relapsing form of DEVIX. The optic neuritis or inflammation in the optic nerves causes the same types of symptoms that it does in isolated optic neuritis or in um, uh, multiple sclerosis. Usually there's pain in the eye associated with loss of vision either by a scotoma, which is a blind spot, or complete blindness. It can be on one side, it can be on both sides, it can occur at the same time in both eyes or one right after the other. As I mentioned, the MRI scan helps to some degree in distinguishing DEVIC syndrome from multiple sclerosis. Um, in our series where we looked uh, initially at all of the patients who had relapsing, uh, the relapsing form of DEVIX and looked at their MRI scans, initially at the onset of the disease, uh, almost two-thirds of them had a completely normal MRI scan, no abnormalities whatsoever, and this was usually after uh, several attacks, actually an average of five attacks in these, in these people. Some people showed some enhancement with the contrast agent that was given. Uh, if they'd really uh, recently had an episode of optic neuritis, and some people showed abnormalities within the brain stem, the area where the brain connects to the spinal cord, but this usually was because there was a lesion in the neck that was extending up into the brain. And just like that case I presented at the beginning, um, of the doctor with, uh, with DEVIX. There are some abnormalities in the, in the cerebral hemispheres, the, the, the large portions of the brain, but usually they don't meet the criteria uh, for multiple sclerosis. They tend to be small and rather nonspecific. Now over follow-up, if you keep doing MRIs on these people, we'll sometimes see um, changes. And in particular, what we see is that more people develop some of these nonspecific white spots. We only had one person um, in the whole series whose MRI ever converted to something that looked like uh, what we see in multiple sclerosis. So that's, a, uh, a, I think, a pretty strong um, uh, paraclinical test that we can do to help support the diagnosis. And this is that same uh, MRI of the brain I showed you before, tiny little spots here, otherwise normal. In multiple sclerosis, uh, in, t in typical MS, people often have involvement of the spinal cord. Uh, it's often called transverse myelitis, although um, the entire cord is not usually affected in its cross-section. It's usually just one portion of the cord, like a quarter or a half of it. Um, what's unusual in DEVIX, as I mentioned earlier, is the extent of the lesions. It's more like what we see in transverse myelitis with a long extension of a lesion over several segments of the spinal cord. And we found that over 90% of people in our series had a, at least one lesion in the spinal cord that extended that far. Usually in MS, for example, it's within one segment. If anybody here has had an MRI, you know that they often give you a substance called gadolinium, which is like a dye that's, that's infused into the, into the veins. And if you've got inflammation that's active, that dye leaks out into the area that's, that's inflamed, 
like the spinal cord, and you can see enhancement, it lights up. And that was seen in a large percentage of people, as was swelling. When there's active inflammation, the cord swells. Over time, what we generally see is when the myelitis is no longer active, usually several months to years after an event, this signal remains in the spinal cord. It's like it's, uh, it's persistent and always there, but often also what happens is the cord shrinks or atrophies. So these are examples of each of these. This is the <clears throat> this is the thoracic spinal cord, so the middle part of the back, and this gray area up here is the spinal cord, and this is the lesion extending from here all the way up to here, four segments. And it might be kind of hard to see, but the spinal cord is also swollen here. It's a little bit fatter than it is down below or up above. This is the same spinal cord, uh, I think about 18 months later. You can see the caliber of the spinal cord here is pretty normal as it is down here and then it's very thin up in here and that's all atrophic or small shrunken spinal cord. <clears throat> as I mentioned, the spinal fluid usually shows uh, abnormalities that also differ from multiple sclerosis and are more similar to uh, what we see in, in, in most situations with transverse myelitis. If you do a spinal tap at a time uh, around an, ac an episode of myelitis, you'll see evidence of inflammation. So there's cells, white blood cells in the spinal fluid, and it can, it can range from normal to almost pus-like, but most of the time there's a moderate number of cells. And then unlike multiple sclerosis, where we rarely see over 50 cells and we almost never see neutrophils, a large uh, a minority, but a significant minority, of people uh, with DEVIX will have uh, one or the other or both of these abnormalities. And we think that helps also distinguish um, uh, DEVIX from, uh, from multiple sclerosis. The protein is often increased, although the amount that it's increased doesn't seem to be related to how much damage there's been to the spinal cord. One thing that's usually tested in the spinal fluid is the presence of oligoclonal bands, which are a, a, a marker and a, a set of antibodies that are looked for um, to help support a diagnosis of MS and demonstrate that the process that's going on is an immunological process. In people that have the relapsing form of Devic syndrome, only about a quarter to a third have oligoclonal bands, whereas in typical multiple sclerosis, um, it's around 85 or 90 percent. So that also is helpful. Now the clinical course is something that we're, uh, those of us who are interested in Devic syndrome are um, particularly interested in being able to work out better as far as prediction. I alluded to the fact earlier that we, we believe now that there's two main types of Devic syndrome. One is the monophasic type and the other is the relapsing type. In the monophasic type, people have both optic neuritis and transverse myelitis that usually occurs very, quite rapidly. So for, in a two-week period, they might experience optic neuritis in one eye and transverse myelitis. They might have it in both eyes as well. There's a period of stabilization and then a recovery phase where if they get some recovery, and most do get some recovery at least, um, followed by basically a remission where during the length of follow-up, usually many years, at least in the cases that we reviewed, uh, there, was, there were no new events. So we call this monophasic one event. More common, we think, is the relapsing form of Devic syndrome. Um, some of you may have heard of relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis, which is the most common type of MS, and that's characterized by recurrent attacks or recurrent episodes of inflammation in the brain and or the spinal cord, and Devic is similar. Um, after having those initial events of optic neuritis and transverse myelitis that help us or that make the diagnosis of Devic syndrome, these people continue to have more attacks. Now, when they present, they usually present with an increased amount of time between attacks. As I mentioned earlier, instead of having several attacks in a couple of weeks, they might have one attack of optic neuritis and then eight months later have transverse myelitis and then 
two years later have optic neuritis again. And when that happens, when it's more spread out like that, we think that that's more likely to turn out to be this relapsing form of Devic syndrome. The relapses are always um, optic neuritis or myelitis. Again, unlike multiple sclerosis where you get symptoms depending on where the inflammation occurs in the brain or the spinal cord. Um, these these uh, uh, people with uh, relapsing DEVEX never get any other symptoms other than optic nerve and spinal cord. And that raises a lot of questions about why that is. What, what is it about the biology um, and the mechanisms of what drives this disease that are different? The other thing that's important and I think important to, to emphasize in, in particular with regards to treatment is that um, many people now believe that treatment of multiple sclerosis should occur very early. In fact, the Multiple Sclerosis Society in the United States states that as soon as the diagnosis of MS is made, if it's relapsing or remitting MS, that people should start a treatment. Well, in typical MS, most people don't uh, accumulate much impairment or disability from an individual attack. Most attacks are pretty mild. They get better, especially early on in the disease. They get either completely better or almost all better. And that's very different than DEVEX. Um, DEVEX attacks tend to be severe. So an individual attack of myelitis often causes complete paraplegia or quadriplegia. Um, an attack of optic neuritis often leads to complete blindness. Now, people can still recover from some of these attacks, but the recovery um, is not as good as typical MS. And so you can see what I would refer to as a stepwise type of deterioration. And here's sort of a schematic to show you the difference between the two um, clinical courses. These are, these are two schematics that demonstrate what a monophasic clinical course might be like. And this occurs in probably less than a quarter of all of these cases, I think. Um, here's simultaneous myelitis and optic neuritis. One event, then quiet. Here's an event of optic neuritis and then two quick events of optic neuritis and myelitis right on, on top of each other, and then quiet. The relapsing group, you see that things are spread out. Here they're spread out and they're single events. Here they're spread out and there's clusters of events. but the major point is that with each of these episodes, there's significant loss of function. <clears throat> what this graph demonstrates is, is um, just some, whoops, some data to prove the, I won't go back to that, to prove the point that um, the more spread out the attacks are initially, the more likely it is to turn out to be the relapsing form of the disorder. Um, whether it's destined to be monophasic or relapsing, um, it doesn't seem to matter too much as far as how it starts. So if it starts with transverse myelitis, it can, or optic neuritis, it can become either mono, or it can be monophasic or it can become relapsing. Although we found that most people who um, had monophasic disease started with optic neuritis. This again demonstrates this, the clustering of the attacks uh, early, so the, the initial events of optic neuritis and myelitis when they occur together um, are more predictive of a monophasic course. What we'd like to be able to do, obviously, is predict who's going to be monophasic and never have another attack and who's going to be relapsing. Because as I've shown, the people that develop the relapsing form are the ones that accumulate all of this impairment and disability. If we knew who those people were going to be early on in the course, we could intervene with some type of treatment in hopes of preventing further attacks. And I think we could probably, with an, with an agent that was good at preventing attacks, we could have a much bigger impact functionally on this disease than we can in multiple sclerosis. <clears throat> now this is uh, some data that's not yet been published, um, but we've reviewed uh, again, all of the cases uh, that we have had uh, the opportunity to follow over over um, a long enough time period to determine whether they were monophasic or relapsing and tried to see whether there was anything th that allowed us to sort out who was going to develop the relapsing course. And it looks, it looks like these are the significant factors. 
being a woman and being older at the time of the onset of the syndrome seem to be associated with developing relapsing, uh, relapsing DEVIX. Older meaning uh, about 40, not old. The longer inter-attack interval, so a longer amount of time between the first event and the second event, in particular it seems that as I mentioned earlier, a, a period of longer than six months between the first attack and the second attack seems to predict uh, the likelihood of relapsing disease. And finally, better recovery from the first episode of transverse myelitis. So people that have an episode of transverse myelitis and get pretty good recovery actually may be at higher risk of having further events later. I touched on some of the issues, the sort of epidemiologic issues before of who gets this and, and male to female ratio, et cetera. But there are some probably important differences between the two groups of DEVIX patients as far as uh, the epidemiology. So looking here, these are all the patients that we had. These are the monophasic ones. These are the relapsing ones. So you see the relapsing uh, group tended to be older, uh, the median uh, age was 40 years old, and women were quite a bit more common in the relapsing group, four, and a, four or five women for every man with the disorder, whereas in the monophasic it was pretty much split. And as I mentioned, the family history it was only in this group and tended to be a family history of rather typical multiple sclerosis. Um, antecedent conditions, is there anything that happens before and uh, DEVIX syndrome starts that might have triggered it. Well, in the monophasic group, what we could find is that about a quarter of people had an identifiable viral illness. Two people had immunizations. Um, this was within a six-month period of uh, developing DEVIX. Now, one of these was within, I think, seven weeks, and the other one was within about 13 weeks. So. It was in the vicinity, but as far as being a causative agent is, is uncertain. It wasn't within, you know, 24 hours. In the relapsing form of uh, DEVIX, we again see that viral infections seeming to be associated with the start of the disease are fairly common. We didn't see anybody with immunizations, but we did see a lot of people that had other autoimmune disorders, in particular uh, autoimmune thyroid problems and other conditions such as Sjogren's syndrome, uh, those were the most common. Now, as far as the relapsing form, um, the relapsing form of Devic syndrome becomes evident pretty early. So a person has an attack of transverse myelitis and then has another attack a few months later of optic neuritis, and we make the diagnosis of Devic syndrome, we're still not sure at that point whether it's going to turn out to be the relapsing form of the disorder or not. I mentioned the things before that the clues, such as being a woman or being about 40, uh, it, and having that longer in, uh, inter-attack interval that might uh, increase the risk, but it doesn't take very long for DEVIX to become a relapsing disorder. In fact, within a year of meeting the diagnostic criteria of us being able to say, yes, this is DEVIX, about 80% of people will have had another episode already, and within three years, it's almost everybody. In the follow-up that we had in our original um, group, which was uh, in the relapsing group about 13 years, um, most people had had several relapses, uh, at least three, ranging anywhere between um, actually one and, and uh, 17 relapses. having the relapsing course is not good. Within three years of onset, this stepwise deterioration um, leads to uh, essentially functional blindness in at least one eye in about half of people and am inability to ambulate without assistance, that is using a cane or a walker or need for a wheelchair, uh, again, in about half of people. And if you look at the natural history of multiple sclerosis, um, and compare it to this, this is much more severe. Another thing that's of concern in DEVIC syndrome is the possibility of respiratory failure. And in our series, we uh, found that to be 
unfortunately relatively common in our relapsing group. It happened in about one-third of all of the people that we'd seen. The reason for that was because of very extensive spinal cord inflammation in the cervical spinal cord in the neck, extending up into the areas where the, uh, the breathing center is. And we found that 12 out of 33 uh, people with a relapsing form of DEVIX developed respiratory failure where they had to, be, had to be intubated and put on a breathing machine to support them. Now, three of those people made it through that initial episode only to have another one. In the end, actually, 11 of those people died. Now, many of these uh, cases occurred in the 1960s and the 1970s at times where medical supportive care wasn't as advanced and as good as it is now. And it, chances are that in this, uh, you know, in 2001, uh, many of these deaths may not have occurred, but their respiratory failure probably would have occurred. This is something called a survival curve, which shows the risk <coughs> for, uh, for death over time uh, based on whether a person has monophasic or relapsing disease. And this basically shows that some people with relapsing DEVIC syndrome get respiratory failure uh, very early, and that's a risk factor for death. So obviously preventing attacks is extremely important. We also re recently looked at what are the factors that can predict uh, the risk of respiratory failure. What, uh, and, and not surprisingly, the number of times that a person has an episode of myelitis increases their risk of getting to uh, respiratory failure more quickly, having more weakness after the first event of transverse myelitis, and then the presence of one of those autoimmune diseases. I'm going to skip over pathology because that's the topic of Dr. Lucanetti's talk who follows me, and I'm sure I would make many mistakes. Treatment of DEVIC syndrome. Whoops. Treatment of, um, treatment of DEVIC syndrome attacks is similar to treatment of transverse myelitis attacks or uh, multiple sclerosis attacks. Generally, we initially start with corticosteroids, st pre uh, intravenous solumedrol or methylprednisolone generally, although in our series there was uh, various means used including intravenous corticosteroids, oral prednisone, and even intramuscular ACTH, which is uh, rarely used anymore. Most people got improvement with their first attacks, whether they were eventually going to be monophasic or not. They, they did improve what we would term to be, a, you know, an important or clinically significant amount of improvement. For the people that had relapsing DEVICs, um, we found that for most attacks there was still some improvement but it was almost always incomplete improvement. In some people who were refractory to steroid treatment in whom their attacks didn't get better with steroids, um, the treating neurologist then went on to use plasma exchange, which you're going to hear more about from Dr. Weinschenker later today, and some people in our series seem to improve. Intravenous immune globulin was only used a couple of times. These were, again, in very refractory uh, attacks that weren't getting any better with steroids and, and, and they didn't work. A key issue is relapse prevention. In multiple sclerosis, the common things that are used are the interferons like Avonex and beta seron, and in Europe and Canada, a drug called Rebif, which is, pro which is on the way to this country, um, and also Copaxone. Now, we had limited experience in our series specifically with these, uh, with the interferons, but we certainly saw several patients in whom, despite the fact that they were on these drugs, they continued to have relapses. Various other immunosuppressive type of uh, types of drugs were used, like imuran or azathioprine, uh, methotrexate, uh, cyclophosphamide, etc. And in sometimes short follow-up, probably not long enough to know the true effect of the drug, um, there seemed to be some stabilization, but you can see that at least two-thirds of people continue to have attacks. So for attacks, we still use steroids and we some, we'll use plasma exchange. For prevention, anecdotally talking with other neurologists at other centers who treat DEVIX and have had some experience in following these people, um, they've shared the experience that, that we've had that 
the drugs for MS don't seem to be as good as we would like them to be. People keep having attacks. We haven't proven that. That's still anecdotal. But Dr. Mandler, whom you heard yesterday, I think you heard about his the protocol that he developed look, looking at uh, an oral uh, immunosuppressive drug called azathioprine or Imuran in combination with oral prednisone. And in his case series, this seemed to help stabilize the course. And ideally what we need now are some trials to be able to compare these treatments and determine uh, whether or not they really are helpful or not helpful. Well, there's a lot of things we could talk about as far as future research. Some of the issues in particular are, can you predict early on who's going to have DEVIX if someone presents with transverse myelitis? Is there anything that we can use to, to tell us whether that's likely to be DEVIX? And right now there really isn't very much unless you can identify that there's an optic nerve problem uh, right from the beginning. Of critical importance is can we identify who the relapsing group of DEVIX patients are and can we do it early and so that we can intervene, prevent some attacks or at least some attacks, if not all attacks, and limit this stepwise accumulation of disability. And finally, what's the most effective treatment for relapses themselves and for relapse prevention? Um, we're trying to organize a, a registry of DEVIX patients, a collection of a description and all of the important data about each individual with DEVIX, because this is an unc uncommon disorder. Um, it's not possible for a single institution, even a big place like Johns Hopkins or the Mayo Clinic, to get enough people, enough uh, patients with this disorder to do a trial. And so we need to organize some kind of multi-center effort. And there's a group at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester that has uh, a support service that allows us to develop an internet or web-based data entry uh, a registry where we can gather uh, interested collaborators, scientists and neurologists from around North America and theoretically the world to identify people who have this disorder and be able to enter their information into the database in an anonymous fashion so that we could study the kinds of questions that I've alluded to earlier as far as epidemiology, who gets it and why, and what is the course and what things predict the course. And then most critically for patients is the ability to conduct a trial, to really try to answer the question of, why, of which drugs work and which don't. So in summary, uh, I, I hope I've convinced you that at least Devic syndrome is worthwhile paying some attention to, that it's a distinct disorder. It's distinct, obviously, from transverse myelitis monophasic single episode transverse myelitis and it's distinct from multiple sclerosis as well based on just the type of events that occur and their severity, the spinal fluid, the MRI and what happens over time. But clearly there's a lot that we can learn about um, DEVIX that's, or that's applicable to both multiple sclerosis and trans transverse myelitis. And these people with DEVIX syndrome have transverse myelitis that's the same as the transverse myelitis you've been hearing about uh, otherwise, as far as its functional consequences. And if there are advances in, um, in DEVIC syndrome, they're going to certainly be applicable to transverse myelitis in general. And we're going to need a lot of help from other people. And I'm going to stop there. Thanks very much.